Nick Kershaw, 10cc, Pink Floyd, Tommy Kitten, Girls Aloud, Westlife, Tom Jones, Mike and the Mechanics, Jean-Michel Jarre. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Wallace is in the house. Wow, oh my yeah. God, wow. Gary, where do we start? Like, he made a good start, right? Yeah, he made a good start, <laughs> yeah. Let's start with Nick Kershaw. Cool. Tell me about Radio Musical, and that's going back to the 80s. That's a thousand years ago. Yeah, exactly. Testing you now, this, yeah, yeah, this really is the time of day. <laughs> Yeah, because the album, I did some of the albums. Yeah. Simon did some, Phillips did some of the albums. So was Mark Rizicki was on there. Mark Rizicki well. was on a couple of tracks with yeah. him. Yeah, I'm really having to dig into the memory bank. Oh, yeah. So on that on that tour, were you playing drums or percussion or both? No, it was percussion because Mark Price was playing drums, but I had, it was that kind of the evolution of that big kind of percussion spaceship cage. You had the rig? I had the rig, yeah, yeah. it kind of came to me on that tour, you know, because it was getting to that point where people, were, there was a lot of percussion, a lot of synthesized drums, yeah. um, use of fair lights and stuff, and, and so like, there was a lot of programming entering songs, and it's like, I want to do all that. Yeah. <laughs> so then that came like the whole pads, the electronic setup, plus all the percussion, plus some drums, so to be able to facilitate all of those things were made. And that kind of album drove me making this big monstrous thing, yeah. which then kind of stuck. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, that album's the problem in the synth. You know, uh, and Nick Kershaw, he's a he's a clear musician, isn't he? Because he gets boy. it. Oh yeah, he gets clever, it. Clever clever lad. Yeah. It was tough to work for. Yeah. Yeah. He never missed a trick. You know, you come off and you go, hmm, song four, second verse, bar four. What did you play? Oh. Oh. Uh, nothing lost. <laughs> Star, I think Star Council before then, because Nick Kershaw brought me up for well. Ah, okay. So let's go back. Let's go. Let's go back even before that. Then, okay. So, um, I just remembered that. Bloody hell! Yeah, <laughs> just remembered. <laughs> so, where did you become a drummer begin and a percussionist? I don't know. I, okay. Very always been a dual kind of relationship as a, as, as, since I was a kid. I guess the first thing I ever got was a pair of set of bongos. Okay. Played them and got a kit about six months later. So there was always, it was that thing, you know, back in the day, it, it, there wasn't any multimedia at home. It was your mum and dad's record collection. Yeah. Which was, the, you know, the, the, the grand total of about eight records. Yeah. <laughs> and there was like a couple of loads of Tom Jones records and yeah. a couple of dodgy Latin records, like a Mondo Ross or something like that. And they'd be like, and so that's kind of growing up, you know, I put one of my mum's records on, like it's like a big band thing, I'll play that, and then you put on that, oh, there's some bongos on that, I'll play bongos to that yeah. one. It was just that kind of necessity thing okay. as a kid. And yeah, um, and they've got some congas on about 10. So I really, have, by about 10 years, I'd kind of had a real percussion drum thing growing simultaneously together, you know. So how old were you when you had your first drum kit, actual? Kit. My first kit was four. Wow. <laughs> so you said you're in the Star Council. Yeah. It was, so how 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 was that discovered? Well, it was. Thing, um, I got a, a bursary to the uh, uh, Royal Academy in the Young Musicians Centre. Amazing. And I went there to study under kind of Steve Edison and Tristan Fry as a child. And the first day I went, I must have. I think I was twelve, thirteen, maybe twelve. And the first day I went, I met Steve White. Oh, we both have been given yeah. bursaries, for, uh, and we met Steve, Steve and I, yeah. and we became very close friends. And we went through that whole classical tuition together until we were 16, 17, mm. Steve and I. Um, you know, that's obviously lots of dis uh, different disciplines, drums, percussion, tints, tunes, and the whole thing. Yeah. And then uh, Stevie got the gig in the Star Council playing drums. Yeah. And we did a little, we did a couple of records together, Steve and I. It was called the Mighty Elton Funk Federation. We did some percussion records. That, um, and Paul Weller was in. He said, "You're good. You should be in my band too." Yeah. <laughs> All right then. <laughs> and so me and, uh, me and Stevie went out on tour and did like that, like the first two records, Cafe Blue and Our Favorite Shop. Okay. And Steve and I went out on tour, him playing drums and me playing perc. Um, 
was 16. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, let's have a story. Nick Kershaw. So, percussion. Yeah. The percussion. Then, you jumped on to? Um, thinking right back now. Yeah, right back. Well, Bob, I'm not, Bob, remember Bob here, David Bowie in Australia, and he took my number and we hung out for a bit. And I remember being at home and he called up. My mum's, my mum's like, the bloke on the phone for you. It's like Tony Bowie. <laughs> David said, look, um, um, I work with a team in New York, the Sheep team, Nile Rogers and Bernard Edwards. Yeah. They've got a new act that they put together. Uh, would you consider moving to New York and being part of the team? I said, sure. And so then I kind of, the next day I flew out and I joined the power station and the Sheep That's team. Amazing. So again, yeah, and I joined with Tony Thompson and, and the Duran boys, so we were doing that, that whole power station thing. Yeah. Number one in America. Um, Amazing. And then, yeah, it was quite big. We did like I did live aid with them. That's right. Yeah. Live yeah. aid with the power. How was that? Nerve wracking. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, we did, we did the we did the live aid with the power station, and it was funny at that time because I'm in the band of the couple of the Duran boys. Um, Roger, the drummer from Duran, he'd been going through some changes, and he was a bit unsteady about playing. Live aid, so yeah. he said, Would oh, you do it? Yeah, so I ended up going off, getting some new stuff on, putting the drum kit back on, and coming back out and playing Duran Duran. So, I played it, and we played like Live Aid twice on the same day. That's incredible. <laughs> when, when you walked out on stage and then you yeah. looked to see a sea of people, well, it's, it's, it's not like that because it was a revolving stage, right? So, the band it was the cars they were playing in front of us, and then yeah. And then you kind of got your, all your guys in the back lines going up to the mic and doing the line check, and you're kind of there, right? Everyone's in place, ready like that, and they press go, and then it's a revolving stage. And as you spin round, the whole of JFK Stadium is there, and you're 19. Oh, and you're thinking, oh, 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 that's a seminal moment, that's a game changer because, you know, all of a sudden you've got hair on your chest and you're a man. But you better get up there and you better get it done because if you fail at that point, you're going to stay failed. You're gonna, if you crumble at that, you know, that's one of those, you know, you, 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 you're in with the big lads now, you know, and you, you, it's, it's a real, that's your baptism of fire right there. Yeah, but it's still, real. even though, okay, it's, we can say, well, hair on your chest, you're a man. You're still only really 19 to play with those yeah, people. Yeah, it's, well, it's that thing, you either step up or step off. Yeah, that's, right. Right. that's yeah. that type of and, yeah. and it was great. Of course, you're terrified and, and you're 19, but you get through it and you acquit yourself very well. And all of a sudden, your career's moved into that realm. Yeah, yeah. And those guys respect you and yeah. then start hiring you yeah. and want to work with you. And, you know, it's you know, there's those moments that change your career and it goes from there. To over there, and you're like, ah, oh. and then all of a sudden you're in the bar with Nick Jagger and David Bowie having a pint. And Bob, mine's a, mine's a Guinness, thanks. <laughs> Dylan's at the bar, come on, get it sorted. <laughs> you know, what an experience. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And yeah, and then, then, then I came back, and uh, after that whole experience in America, it was great, but still, I mean, 20. And we did the uh, that Music Over tour. And funny, it's a funny story, right? We were playing at the Secret Policeman's Ball, you know, the, all the acts on, you know, and it was, it's a great cause. So we were there sound checking, and Ben Clinton came up to me with a coat on and a beard. He said, You're right, man. I said, Yeah, man, what are you doing? He said, Who are you playing with, man? He said, Oh, I'm playing with Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel. I went, Oh, great, great, thanks, so man. He said, uh, Come sound out with us to the sound check. I said, Yeah, yeah, all right, let's do it in a minute. To the sound check, and then he tells us, Oh, I'll talk to Ben Gilmore. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I went and found him after the sound check and bumped into Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel. I said, oh, come in, have a chat. We were sat and have a chat, you know, as you do. As you do, yeah. As you do, yeah. And uh, it's like, well, look, have a great show. See you at the after party for Sherry. Yeah, yeah. Great, never mind, that's great. And obviously, Kate, at that point of her career, is tearing it up. Gabriel's obviously off the hook. Yeah, uh, yeah a marvellous artist. And you yeah. sit there and watch him tell his face, like, bloody hell, that's. And Gilmore's tonking. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely tonking. 
And funny enough, I was, I was on a date the next morning, and the, the doctor said, he called me up and said, oh, we met last night. He said, I'm reforming my band. Do you want to join? I said, well, who are you? And they went, oh, Floyd. I went, well, that sounds good. So I went, when are we off? He went, come down tomorrow. I'll play you the songs. We fly on Friday. This was a Tuesday. All right, then. Came down, we had a cup of tea. Played the new record. He said, these are the guys. Gary. There's your ticket. See you at the airport. Then we landed. Pink Floyd began. began. So you're on tour with Pink Floyd. Wow. Yeah, that was a pretty well thing. Uh, because I, I was so gloriously naive. Yeah. And that kind of made it better for me in a way because I didn't have any preconceived notions. And I wasn't, I wasn't frightened about playing in such a big band. It's like, right, dudes, what do you want to play? And that was. That, 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 Definitely to your advantage because you're not overwhelmed with the status of what it already is. Yeah. So it was like, hi lads, got a lot of lights, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Where do you think about it? So, <laughs> oh, nice shoes. Oh, it's a lot of lights. Yeah. And yeah. so that, what was nice about that, it, that out of being naive, it makes you fearless. Yeah. Because you're not, you know, you're not overwhelmed or in awe of what you're doing. It's only so, a few years ago. Um, and kindly took me on stage when the curtain was down just before the show on a Westlife gig right. to, to check out your rig in, in our arena just on the roof. Yeah. Um, and you were MD in that, and then there was Girls Aloud. Yeah, I kind of got what well, there was. You got into the pop thing a little bit. Yeah, because of all the programming yeah. and producing a lot of records at that point, I kind of got dragged into the pop thing. And it was, you know, it was at that time where people used a lot of playback. Lot of samples, you know, and obviously that's my world, the electronic thing. Um, and I'd MD'd a lot before, so they were like, oh, you MD, you play the drums, and you cover all the electronics. Great. And that, although that criteria put you in prime place yeah. for all the pop acts, so all of a sudden there was like a lot of knocking on doors, like, yeah. can you do this? Can you? And then what I'd do a lot is I'd, I'd take in their tour, program it, set them up pick the players, do the arrangements, rehearse them, and then let them oh, go. Yeah. Like, next. So I was, I was doing, for, for about five years, I just actually just set tours up, rehearsed yeah. them, and then sent them on their way, so I didn't have to play them. <laughs> <laughs> not, in a, not a bad way, but it's just like, you, you're good, you go do this, I, yeah. I'll take the next one. Anyway. So yeah, I got kind of caught in that whole pop thing. But it's amazing how diverse, if you look from where it started, Star Council, Nick Kershaw, Pink Floyd, and then you get dragged into the to the pop world. Look how diverse those acts are. That's right. that's just a testament to how versatile you are as a musician, which is just incredible. Yeah, there's all those kind of well, there, as you say, there's John Michel Jarre up, up yeah. the way. That was a pretty wild ride. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you get that gig? In a pub in London or? No, but it was shopping part, in Woolies. It, well, no, it was part of another. <laughs> it, was, it was not not dissimilar. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was playing a gig in Germany. It was one of those things. I was playing a gig in Germany, and uh, the guy said, "Oh, you play nice John. I said, "Oh, man, and we had a beer, swap numbers." Same thing. A couple of weeks later, he called me and said, "I want to talk with John Michel Jean. He's doing this really big thing, and he's he was on about that bloke from Pink Floyd." More lights. That's you, isn't it? I went, yeah. John Michelle wants to have a world with you. John. Wow. We're doing the pyramid, we're doing the Millennium Show at the Pyramids at midnight. Would you, do you fancy it? Like, Alright then. <laughs> Come, we'll have a knock. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and how long did that last? Well, we we did that we did the six week rehearsal in Paris into the Millennium. It was really a very complex show. Um, um, yeah, and then we did the Obviously, the pyramids thing at midnight on the menu. And then, yeah, we stayed in touch and did things on for about five years after that. Yeah, it's a 10 cc along the way. That's yeah. the best. That was great. Good. Good fun. Well, that was that. That was the, that was the, that's the one. You know, like when you're a kid, you sit in your room and there's those great, what I call tennis racket moments where you kind of you're, you think you're in the stadium. <laughs> you know, you're playing air drums in your bedroom thinking, one oh, day I'm going to kick that. I'm yeah. going to be up there. That's going to be me, the lights. Sexy with chicks, right? <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, you know. And but the records I used to do do that, do that to as a child were ten cc records. Yeah. So I learned, you know, verbatim, dot for dot, groove for groove, 
everything they ever made. And uh, it was a few years later, and I bumped into Graham Book. Lovely chap. And, and he, he, same thing, he said, Will we call the 10CC? We're going to do a Japanese tour to see how it goes. Looking for a drummer, would you be transient? I said, Love to. Absolutely love to. And uh, so I'm going for rehearsals and meet the guys. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. And uh, so I said, Oh, what's the song list? And he, he put that song and said, uh, Have you got a set order? Probably the set order. So, yeah, he said, Let's plan a show from top to bottom. We haven't, we haven't planned anything yet. He said, Don't worry, I know it. <laughs> I know it. You know you've ever played. And we did. We went that first morning and played the show from top to bottom. And Graham, Graham went, What are we going to do with the next two weeks of rehearsal? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, cancel. And, and it, was that, it, was that great, it was that great, it was that great kind of circle of life moment where. That thing I adored so much, yeah. and it had so much influence on my playing and my musicianship. Because all those crazy, crazy changes in Ten CC, you know, all those it's like kind of multiple songs in one song, and I, I really fell in love with that. And going to play with them, that was the that was the forget all the other guys. Yeah, that was the dream. That was the that was, well, that was the one where it, all of my dreams as a child were connected. Yeah, that's great. All of those moments yeah. where you go. <laughs> They're gonna pay me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, of course, there was Mike and the Mecha Mike and the Mechanics, yeah. which is in the middle of all of this, which we're playing tonight at St David's, mm. and that's been um, that's been a thirty-year tenure for me. That's that's fourteen albums of thirty years. Okay, how did you get back in? How was it back? Oh, it's even funnier. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's this big gig, this big stadium. Thing, big charity show uh, for a children's charity, and Genesis are doing it, Pink Floyd are doing it, Queen and Clapton. That's the bill. So I get a phone call off my brother who I've never met, and he said, uh, I'm a very good MD, you're very good at putting things together. He said, uh, We're doing this show, uh, Queen and Clapton, and Genesis and Pink Floyd. He said, You know, well, you played all their records together, would you come down and MD? When are we starting? Tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and it's like well, another one of those things just turned up, drum kit, you know, massive studio, and me and Roger Taylor playing dr double drums together. Cool. Yeah, do the Queen thing and then the, you know, and have to go down and sample all of Phil's drums. And the first thing up that morning, morning is Collins having a cup of coffee, Clapton having a cup of coffee, the whole of Genesis. Right, morning, tonight, tonight, invisible touch, straight up. There you go. Morning. <laughs> and I have to nail the Genesis thing, like from top to bottom. Me and Phil doing a double solo. That was that was the first morning after the coffee. Stress, pressure, or how you can play or you can't, right? What what an amazing, amazing <laughs> philosophy to have, isn't it? Yeah, you can either do it or not, so do it or go. Well you know it's that first, <laughs> it's that first thing. You know internally whether whether it's inside you or not. You're fully sentient and aware. Is that, am I capable of that? Can I play that? Is that inside me? Yes, it is. So if it's in there, all you've got to do is calm yourself and focus yourself to not let any of that exterior stuff interfere. Because okay. that's all it is. That interference is just doubt, you know, your demons, you know, what, you know whatever you want to call it. But how do you get that level? Yoga? Meditation? How, how do you get there? I, Talk to yourself? I don't know. Everyone's got their own... Method, yeah. But you, you're in the box, in the zone. Let's go. That's that's it. That's all you can see. And nothing else. You have someone have a train crash next to you. So that doesn't matter. I've got to do invisible touch. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, um, and it was nice. And I did, I did a few songs with Eric, and obviously did the Pink Floyd stuff. That was a, that was nice and easy. And we did the show. That was a great success. And then Rutherford called me up again a couple of days later. And said, really, the great show. Nice working with you. Um, we're about to do the Mechanics album. Would you come down and record the record? I said, love to. And then I went down to the farm and we cut five or six tracks on that. And um, sure enough, about a month later, Mike said, look, album went great. We got, got, a, um, got a top five album. I think we're the number two in the charts with a, with a single. I said, look, we're going to do quite a big world tour. 
would you consider joining the band? I said, yeah, I'd love to. And the mechanics there it begins, and we're still plugging away. Yeah. With all of our grey hair. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Jones. Tom. How did that begin? Oh, the King of Wales. You know, that's it. The King of Wales. How oh. did that start? Oh, that's. Let me think. How did that start? Ah, they're all good stories, by the way. I was MDing the Prince's Trust, and I'd MD quite a lot of those over the years. And, you know, you get that multiple artist thing, house band. Yeah. They come in minimal rehearsal, and you know you get up there, and each artist does two or three tunes. Um, and we were doing uh, Prince Trust Curly, um, and he was. We, the lineup had come in, and we were rehearsing it all. Um, and someone, someone said, and someone came and said, "I think we can get Tom Jones. It would be great." And it was sure enough, we got him, and he got on a plane from LA and flew in. And Walked in this person, I went, Gary Watts, Tom Jones, all right. He said, are you ready? I went, are you ready? <laughs> Tom, see what you got then. And it was a great band, and we yeah. nailed him to the wall. Yeah. And then the old kid, the King of Wales went, oh, it's like that, is it? And he sang that half, and we went, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. And it was one of those real coming togethers where we were on fire, he was even more on fire. We played it whilst he went, that's sad then. <laughs> I have a quick chat about electronics because um, you just showed me a picture of your next rig. Oh, sure. On your next gig. Yeah. Schiller. Schiller. And the rig is insane. Mm. Um, it's, it's absolutely gigantic. Mm. So, talk us through this rig and, and perhaps you can send us a picture after that we can put up to show sure. people as well. Well, that's, it's kind of, it's a carry on from, actually, it's a, from that Nick Kershaw team. Okay. It's that philosophy where it's a big, huge, standing up kind of cage affair. Um, but this is slightly different. This is more like the Jean Michel Jarre thing where you have like a big acoustic kit. So it works like almost like an orchestral station. So there's like a big rock kit here. Um, you get to this, over to this section, this becomes very percussive, um, octobans, timbales, stuff, you know, and then you get around here, then that's like, 20 pads around here or something like that. Yeah. Then there's kind of gong drums, orchestral stuff behind. <laughs> well, the so, madness as well, because I've got triggers on all the drums, so they're all changing as well. And the, each pad, you know, like you'll be playing a, a certain section of a song, and I'll, let's say I've kind of got like, um, having like the, the hi-hat delay here, and a snare delay there, and a, and a secondary like eight or eight trigger there. Like that. But then I might have to get into some tom tom, and what I'll do is I'll have those those pads, the sounds of those pads move as I'm moving around the kit. So those pads will retrack. So instead, they because I'm on this side of the kit, they, those samples are here. But as I move around the kit, I'll have a MIDI change, and those samples will move to this set of pads. And as I move around, they'll move to this set of pads. So I've still got the same access, but from different areas of the kit. So I'll have MIDI track movement on the on the sample changes as I'm moving around the kit. That's my enjoyment. I, I'm actually getting anxious <laughs> talking about it. I'm actually getting stressed out. It's a lot of uh, well, it's one, it's one, you know, it's one of those things where you got to sit down yeah. with a pen and a big book and yeah, just sit yeah. and, and join the dots. Yeah, you got to sit. And, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things you've got to make a plan. It's it's not it's no winging it. You've got to make a plan. You've got to internalize this. What I'm going to play, say I'm going to play, and then put it up there see if it works, and then write it down again. And then internalize it so it's hard and it's in your head. And you know, when you write, when you externalize things, especially when you write them, yeah, because you've quantified it by getting it out, yeah, it puts it, it in. goes in, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's okay. a lot of that, there's a lot of methodology in that. Um, let's have a quick shout out for gear. What gear are you currently using on the mechanics? <clears throat> I'm using this, um, it's the, the DW Purple Heart kit, which is a very interesting wood, yeah. really very hard. They've only made a few kits in it. Um, yeah, so I've got like an 8, 10, 12 up the top, 14, 16, 22 inch gong drum, 14 by 5 copper, 12 by 4 purple heart second snare, and four octobands. Yeah. And uh, and just six releases pads over the top of that. Yeah. Income releases, new releases, brains. A lot smaller than the Schiller gig. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> and then obviously my trusty Zildjian's. Yeah. Um, what have I got? An 18 EFX, 19 Dark K, 8 inch A, 8 and 10 A. No, sorry, it's a 6 and an 8 rather than this kit. Yeah, a very old 22 Heavy K, nice. a 20 inch Dark K crash, and a 24 inch Swish, which is like from about 1979. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. That's a big symbol. Yeah, big symbols, but the lovely thing about big symbols is not hitting them hard. Yeah. So they're musical, so they you hit them and they fold into the kit. Yeah. Not this thing where you see people hitting symbols like that, smash, that's all you can hear. Down all the vocal mics, it's down everything. Every, yeah. You've ruined the band. So those are lovely big symbols, you can just hit them and they melt into the kit and they're musical. Rather than these <coughs> little things that yeah. people just hit them very hard and they just go clang. Just to make some noise. Clang, yeah, that's really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the Schiller kit there, it's like that and that is. Um, DW have made a set of custom drums for this, which I've never really made before. Um, it's all concert tom toms, yeah. old school concert tom toms, which DW don't make. Yeah. But they've made this, made it, made this set and they are absolutely kicking. <laughs> like you've never heard kicking. I mean, forget the Gretsch and the old Ludwig and the Talmud, which I'm a massive fan of. Yeah. They, they, they made me this set and I went, I got them out of the boxes and I went, Jesus. Yeah. You hit them and you're in 1974 immediately. And <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, and, you know, no brassiers on anything, no floats. Hard mount straight to the shelves like it used to be. Yeah, old school. So they're really, yes. they've really got them, they're anchored to the stand and they, they grunt really hard. Uh, so that kit's really interesting because I'm standing up playing it. Yeah. Um, and again, it's that orchestral thing, kind of different station. But that's anything got to So drum wise, that's yeah, four octave bands, 12 inch snare, 13 inch snare, 14 inch snare, eight. 10, 12, 14, 16, 22 inch gong, 13, 14 past that tom, another 22 inch gong, and then I think on this side, that's 12 circular pads mapped around that, yeah. and then another six around that side, and then Two DW kicks and then two E kicks between those. Plus, and um, yeah, and then racks and racks of electronics. And how many drum techs have you got? I've only got the one. I'm very overworked, the poor son. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he, I've got the one, but he uh, he certainly has a lot of stage hands with him. Yeah, it's a real. It's a complex, it's, and it's such a big build because if you get any part of it bent, it's all done for. Yeah. So it's a really meticulous build, you know, with all of the, um, like, you know, levels, putting levels on every bar, so it all sits down. You know. How long did it take him to set up the the rig for the shilling? In is six hours. Out's four hours. But that's with two other guys helping. It's, I think it's 14 flight cases. So it's a, it's a day's work before we started the gig. Precisely, yeah. <laughs> and then, then another couple of hours to mark it all up. Oh. Are you popular? Oh, they love me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, ever since I followed your career from being on the back of Rhythm Magazine advertising Tarman Art Star drums oh, yes. there years and years ago. Years. Uh, years ago, <laughs> yeah, years ago. Up until now, DW Zildjian. Um, I've only ever, ever known you on tour. I, I've never known you to stop. So, do you, do you just like the, the, adrenal, the adrenaline? Do you like the challenge? Do you just not want to go home? Do you just absolutely adore touring life? I love touring life, and it's a very simple thing. It's that thing, you know, we all love playing. Yeah. We all live to play. But being able to play and have the immediate gratification, or not, but the response is immediate. What they think or what they don't, what they like or what they dislike, yeah. they'll let you know, and it's immediate. So I love that and the immediate response of playing live, and always have. Yeah. You know, 
you know, I get to an off studio date, so that's great, but that is kind of clinical thing. You're you're playing into the unknown. Yeah, yeah. But that lovely thing when you play live, you chill it, they scream at you. So yeah, I'm good. <laughs> you know, or you f it up and then was it? Like, Did he supposed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's a very truthful existence, you yeah. know. They, they they only reflect what you do. And I really I've always that's the most exciting yeah. part. Well I think that is. Performance is the, for me is the the best part of playing. Yeah. Recording yeah. is always a glorious art. Yeah. But the performance is, you know, it's always. It's the one for you. Yeah. Yes. It's it's a, it's the greatest payoff. And and just one more question, just one more, following on from what you so said. Sorry, band manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, because you're always on tour. Um, yeah, you're still running so many other projects. Um, on your way down here uh, yesterday, you were saying you'd already cut quite a few tracks to be sent off into the ether. Yeah, well, you know, we, we, we live in this modern age where, you, as we all know, you can people send you a song, you cut it and send it back. You know, it's on the tour bus yesterday, got some songs sent in, hacked it, did it, recorded, put the stems in, got off, put on the internet, sent it back. Thank you, all done. On stage by night, tour bus by day. Oh writing. yeah, writing, hacking, arrangements. Yeah, it's so. You know, we've got laptops. What you can do with a laptop now is just it's stupid. Yeah. yeah so I'll, I'll do some work. Not long gone of those days sitting on tour buses and just watching junk TV. Oh, so great morning, cup of coffee, laptop open, business. <laughs> you know. You go. Yeah, you, yeah. And, and that way you can. The, the lovely thing about that is all the new stuff I've got coming up. Um, I go straight out to Schiller after this, and then straight out to Tom Jones for the World Tour. So there's another there's another 65 songs yet to be arranged for that. But while I'm travelling all day, I can sit and prep the arrangements, yeah. go through them, listen to them, send them out to the to the client. And say, yeah. what do you think? How's that working for you? Oh, that's great. Can we adjust this? Sure, adjust it. So you 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 preempted all of that hard work by getting the arrangement right. Yeah. Using that. Norm, that time which would be normally dead on a tour bus, they can now, you know, utilize all of that dead time into music. Welcome to the modern age, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> love that, love that. Um, thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Pleasure. To come from your hotel early morning, come and hang out with us, have a chat. And I have to say, listening to you speak, um, I've met you a couple of times before, but on a one to one basis, you're clearly a genius. Um, you're a you clearly drink too much. <laughs> <laughs> I only had one coffee today. You're, you're clearly a musical genius. And um, no, I assure you, I just about get away with it. Oh, you clearly get away with it. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're a musical genius, Gary. And um, it's nice to uh, be in your company because I'm now thinking, oh, what can I do? What can I do? I want to thank you so much. Thank you for coming to see us. Anytime. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. I say this is a great setup down here. This is proper old school drums, like drum shops should be. Yes, that's right. You know, you walk in, it's all exciting. Kid in the candy store. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, lovely things going. Come on, buy me, yeah. buy me, play me. Yeah. It's because it's so. This side of our industry is dying. It's dying. That's right. Yeah. And it's so nice to see it because it is. You know, like the symbol walk here. You walk in, <clears throat> stick. You know, I did have one of these. Because I still remember that thing as a child. Yeah. I was doing. You know, these kind of these golden nuggets of joy that yeah. I can't own. Yeah. One day I will. That's right.